Please turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. Sorry, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. Philippians chapter 3 can be found on page 1044 of your pew Bibles. Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 17. Hear now the word of your God. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, and we pray now that your Holy Spirit would indeed be with us and would bless us, Lord, transform our hearts, lift up our eyes unto heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How can you be a good Christian? Have you ever found yourself struggling with your faith? How do I become a good Christian? How do I do the things that a Christian is supposed to do? Do you understand the type of responsibilities, the amount of work I have to do, the things that are on my mind, the burdens I carry? How is it possible to be like the saints of the New Testament? I don't know how to do it. How did they do it? How do you in your life, Christian, how do you live like a New Testament believer? The zealousy that we find in the New Testament wasn't meant to die after the closing of the New Testament. But you can have it in your own life. And one of the ways you start to cultivate a good Christian life is to walk as a citizen of heaven. And that's your call today, is to walk as a citizen of heaven. Now, walk as a citizen of heaven. First, you need to follow the example set for you. Follow the example before you. Look with me at verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. Last week, we spent the whole time looking at the reality that you are in a Christian race. You are running and you know what your prize is, but if you've ever looked at the life of any athlete, every athlete who's become famous always had someone before them they looked up to. Always had a role model that they thought, I want to be like that person. One of my favorite stories from the last Olympics was a picture of Michael Phelps and this kid from Malaysia. And they had this picture of this, this amazing, multi-gold, medal-winning Michael Phelps standing next to this little kid from Malaysia. And then in the next frame, they showed that little kid who's now a grown man competing in the Olympics in swimming against Michael Phelps. And he decided when he was a little kid, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat him. <laughs> Who are you chasing after? What are the models that you have set before you in your own life as you run the Christian race? Well, Paul here in verse 17 starts out with himself. He says, brethren, 
join in following my example. Join in following my example. If you've read through the New Testament before, Paul is an amazing example of what it means to have Christian hope and Christian perseverance. The guy gets shipwrecked and he's preaching the gospel as he's just been shipwrecked. The guy is getting lashed with, lashed with whips and then thrown out of the city and stoned. And then he, he, one of the maz- most amazing stories of Acts is he gets taken outside the city and they stone him. They think he's dead. The, the other disciples in the city, they come and they, they get him. And he goes back into the city. <laughs> Imagine getting a death sentence, the death sentence failing, and then going back and doing the exact same thing you're just trying to be killed for. That's a model to follow. But some of you might go, well, hold on here. Isn't that kind of a little pompous? Isn't that kind of a little bit prideful for Paul to say, follow me? Isn't last week, wasn't your whole point of last week supposed to be that we follow Jesus? Isn't Paul putting himself up on a pedestal here? Well, no, it's not. Remember what he said in in chapter 3, verse 12. Look, Look down there with me. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Paul says, I'm not already perfect, but yet I've I've put an example in front of you. You can follow that example. I think one of the things that God has blessed us with is the point of discipleship. That God told the disciples to go out into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and making disciples, teaching them to to obey all which I have commanded you. He gives the disciples the, the responsibility to go out and to make more disciples. And that continues down in the line of the church. That's the pattern that God has given us. But it's not just Paul. Notice the shift in verse 17. He starts with I and me, and then he switches. Brethren, follow in, join in following my example. And then the switch happens in the middle of the verse. And note those who so walk as you have, not me for a pattern, but us for a pattern. Who are the people Paul's talking about? Who are the us? Who are the other patterns that we can look at and follow? Well, we spent a whole week looking at two of those examples that Paul gave us in chapter 2. He gave us Timothy as an example of godliness and righteousness. And he also gave us the example of Epaphroditus, who is also an example, someone who is even willing to die for the gospel. We have examples before us of two godly disciples of Paul. But it's interesting if we we move past that and we realize that Paul might also be talking about the elders of the church there. Keep your finger in Philippians and turn over with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4 can be found... On page 1054, 1054 of your pew Bibles. And this is what Paul is talking to the elders here. Paul is talking to Timothy and the elders. And he specifically says of Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Let no one despise you, no one, let no one despise your youth, but be what? But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Paul tells Timothy, be an example in all these ways, in all your Christian life. Be an example. And then if you turn over to another one of uh, Paul's disciples, Titus. Titus chapter 2. Just turn over a few pages, page 1059. Titus chapter 2, verse 7. What does he say to to Titus, in all things show yourself to be a good pattern or a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. And he goes on about how he's supposed to be an example or a pattern of good works. So Paul has told Timothy he needs to be an example. Paul tells Titus that he needs to be a pattern. And then if we, this isn't just Paul talking, turn over to 
the book of 1 Peter, just a few more pages down the road. 1 Peter chapter 3, or chapter 5, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 5, page 1078. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. We see that this is not just a Pauline doctrine or something that Paul has given us, but this is a biblical principle that there are to be godly examples in the church. 1 Peter 5, 3. We'll start at verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. That word can also be translated elders. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being what? Being examples to the flock. The shepherds, the elders, the overseers, the presbyters of the people are the examples that God has placed in the church in Philippi. In all the churches, this is, this is why the qualifications for elders and deacons is so important that Paul gives. He says they have to be godly men. They have to be above repute. Please don't take it lightly when you do elders, elder elections to pick the most popular person, pick the most godly person. Not the person who has the biggest bank account or wears the best clothes, but, but the person who knows the Lord most. Those are the examples that we're to follow. But, praise God, there's an even bigger example than Paul. An even better example than Timothy, than Titus, than Epaphroditus, than Peter. But the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is what Paul told us in, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. That it was Jesus Christ who set the example for us of humility. That it was Jesus Christ that even though he was God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but set aside, set aside heaven itself and came in the likeness of man. Came as a servant. Jesus Christ is your great example. He is the pattern you have set before you of how you are to live your life. Look to Jesus Christ. He's our model. Have, have, you ever, have you ever seen someone cast something in metal before? It's amazing what, what will happen is somebody will make something really well, and it might take them a lot of time because they want to get it exactly perfect. I remember watching a man, he wanted to forge or to cast swords. And so he spent lots and lots of time on this sword. He, he, he used a mill to make sure that the, that the blade was absolutely perfect. There was no imperfections in the metal. He polished it off to make sure that there would be nothing, uh, no pits in it. And, and it was absolutely perfect. And then he took that sword and he, he put it in a type of, of sandy clay. And he, he put it and he, and he packed all the sand around it. And then after that, he took, the, he took the two sides apart and he took the sword out and he put it back together. And that was the mold. And then the hot metal was poured into the top into a hole and it would go down in there and it would, it would fill up the crevice that the old sword had made so that when the metal was poured in, it looked exactly like what the original was. Jesus Christ is the original. And you're being poured into the mold of Jesus Christ. He is our pattern. He is our example. He is the one that you are becoming more and more like. Who are you following? Who are you following in this life? What's the pattern you've set for yourself? Are you looking to Jesus Christ in your decisions and how you live your life and what you love and what you find joy in? And I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes that means you just got to slow down. We are in a go, 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 go culture. Always this, always that, this activity, this thing. Your kids have to go there. Your grandkids have to go there. You have so many things to do. Social media is always in front of you. And if you don't take a time to just step back and to just evaluate your soul, you're going to miss it. The world wants to keep you busy. You need to give your si yourself buffer room to be able to slow down and ask yourself, am I running on the right road? Am I following the right leader? Have I been going after the right example? 
But there's another reality of how we walk as citizens of heaven. That's a hard thing we have for us in verses 18 and 19. You need to remember the warnings. You need to remember the warnings. Look with me at verses 18 and 19. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. You have been warned again and again and again by pastor after pastor after pastor from this pulpit about those whose way of life as a pattern is walking the way of death. Paul is telling here, I've I've been with you as, as the pastor. Remember, Paul is the pastor of Philippi. He's told them, I've warned you about them. I've warned you that their walk, their pattern of life, the things they do habitually over and over again shows that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. You've been warned about them. And I hope you hear the, the urgency and the pleading in Paul's voice. He's telling them this is a salvation issue. If you are walking in the way of hellions, you're going to go to hell. You cannot live your life deliberately seeking the things of darkness and believe you're a Christian. F.F. Bruce, when he was commenting on this section, said, Those who deliberately indulge in sin and repudiate the will of God deny all that the cross of Christ stands for. Do not be those who deny all that the cross of Jesus Christ stands for. There are those in this world who would seek to pull you from Jesus Christ. Satan would love nothing more than to, than to suck you into the things of this world. I can't tell you how many times I have heard pastors beg and plead with people in the church to flee from the sin that they were following. Hearing a pastor with tears in his eyes tell a woman, don't leave your husband. There's no biblical warrant for it. You're going to ruin your children. You're going to ruin your family. You're going to send shockwaves through the congregation. Don't do it. To men saying to them, don't you dare go sleep with that woman. You're going to ruin your family. You're going to put scars so deep in your wife that you'll have a hard time healing. Hearing pastors plead with a drunkard, stop, stop, you're ruining your life. Paul is pleading. Even now with tears here warning them that there are those who have set a pattern of their lives an example that shows that they are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Stay far away from them. Stay far away from them. They might be the most popular people in your social group. Be an outcast with them and be in with Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't hold any punches here. The scriptures specifically tell us their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame. The last great day, the enemies of the cross of Christ are going to have to sit before the judgment seat of the Lamb. Don't stand before them in that same place. Their end will be destruction. Don't follow those whose pattern of their life is all about fulfilling their own desires. Again, it's easy to pick on culture, but flick on the TV and everything you'll find in commercials is nothing but you want more of this, you want more of that, you want more of this, here's the best food, here's the best drink, here's the best alcohol, here's here's the best false life we can possibly offer to you. 
and our consumerist buying culture is founded on this very idea. Our very economy is founded on this lie. Fulfill every desire you have and you'll be happy. Brothers and sisters, it is Jesus Christ who will give you joy. Look to him. Go to him. Run to Jesus Christ. Praise God that's not the end of the sermon. Praise God that's not where the Lord ends us with warnings. But he gives us a great promise. Look with me at verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Realize, Christian, this is your third point. Realize you are a citizen 